this is not, this is a great football team we played tonight. That, that's a hell of a football team. I mean, they haven't allowed more than 100 yards against anybody. So for us to come out and do what we did tonight, I think shows you that what our kids are capable of. First catch when they told me, you know, it was coming my way, I was actually kind of like nervous because like, it's a big moment. Second catch came, I was like, you know, I had to put my team on the back, put my team on my back and just keep pushing, you know. And I was happy, I was happy, that's all I can say. This is a big win for us. I've been looking forward to it since the season started. It's always been, I've been working for it, for enough. Do you yeah, like, think you made a statement tonight? There is a guy that writes the audibles. I don't know who he is, yeah. but there's a guy that writes the audibles. That for some reason, I'm surprised he's here. He hasn't been to a lot of SEC games, but he's able to swing by tonight. So I was appreciative that he's able to come by and cover the SEC. So it was good. Yeah, this this was our statement game. Telling telling everybody that Hamden is here. We're coming for stage. What uh, what people write in audibles and stuff like that in the weekly things? Those are things that are out of my control. We can only do what we can do to control what we can show. Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to the Meat Grinder, your weekly dose of high school football talk in Connecticut. And I, of course, am your host, Sean Patrick Foley. And with me, as always, is Big Petey Paguaga. Petey, how are you? Big. I mean, I know I haven't Peloton in a while, but um, no, good to be back. What a, a wild week in week three, followed up by a wild week in week four. And now, do we get a buy? I feel like we deserve a buy. Yeah, we deserve a buy. We don't get a buy. We don't get a buy until Christmas, I think. That's our <laughs> buy. Our buy week is week 22. <laughs> Christmas <laughs> week. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it was another great week. And uh, at the top of the show, you heard a little bit from Hamden. The Hamden Green Dragons with the huge 42-27 victory over Class double L runner up Fairfield prep granted you it's it's not the same team, but beating a team that went and played for a state finals has been one of the best teams in the SEC for a better part of the last 10 years. The Green Dragons off the deck beating Fairfield prep staying unbeaten. That's the first time they've beaten since 2009 and the first time since 4-0 since 2009. And you heard a little bit from the guys who made it all happen, including Cameron Kemp, who rushed for nearly 200 yards and a couple TDs. He says it's a statement game. You heard a little bit from Anthony Bolden, who had a, had a fumble recovery and had two great, great catches and some big time decisions by Tom Dyer and his staff to put that game away. Just when Fairfield Prep thought it had all the momentum, two great catches. And then, of course, I heard a little bit from Tom Dyer, just immensely proud of this team and giving us the big, or I should say me, giving me the business right in front of them. You know, I don't go to the SEC games. You know, I, I doubt them. I this and that. Hey, hey, you know what? He's not wrong, except I do go to SEC games, Tom. It just it's not your games. <laughs> oh, this- not anymore. Not yeah, anymore. Not anymore. The- I was Team really Dragons. impressed with Hamden, Pete. Really impressed. I'm glad I showed up there. Uh, I had a feeling they might be have a chance to win that game. It was either that or the other game down the road, just across the border there over in North Haven, North Haven beating up on Shelton. We'll get to that. That's the topic of the show. You heard a little bit from Hamden. It was a crazy non-alliance week. All hail the conference league play games, Pete. All hail. It was a great week. for We thought it was going to be a bad, quiet week. A couple matchups here and there, you know, Berlin, Bloomfield, but Staples uh, and Trumbull. But, you know, the SEC had some pretty good ones and. uh yeah, like I said, uh, yeah, not a, a non-alliance week turned out to be almost, if not just as good. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, you know, Hamden, that's a great win for them. I mean, hats off to the Green Dragons. Uh, we'll probably be at more of their games now, but probably not for uh, a couple of weeks because I expect the Green Dragons to win their next, like, four games. So maybe we'll see them on the 11th against West Haven. Uh, until then, you know, hats off to Hamden, great game. I mean, Trumbull Staples was awesome. Bloomfield, Berlin coming down to the last second, a game-winning walk-off field goal. I mean, it really was a very, very good week of conference play. I mean, there were some really good matchups. Obviously, North Haven, Shelton, 
I mean, you know, we saw a lot. Law beat up Branford. I mean, that was a that's a great win for Law, who had come into the game with three kind of easy wins, and we were expecting, okay, what are they going to – are they for real? Went out, beat a good Branford team. Massick, I mean, New Fairfield fought in that game in the SWC. Massick, though, held on. New Milford. Won New Milford. Um, but I say New Massick. Uh, New Fairfield. <laughs> uh, New Fairfield. You know, New Milford played really well in that game. Uh, Massick held on. I mean, there were some really, really good games, some good performances. I mean, just jumping down just a Saturday, Max Nyland of Ram, eight touchdowns, yeah. tied for third most all time in state history. That's, That's pretty, pretty wild. Good. And they would, they were good. not going to leave. They were not going to leave us alone until we heard about it. No, they uh, did until not they, leave we acknowledged us alone. it on Instagram. <laughs> it was yeah, great. just I don't know if it's published yet or not, but Max Nyland, athlete of the week, Nom, go vote, go vote for him. Yeah, go vote. All for of him. those people in our Instagram better vote for him. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, eight touchdowns, third all time. Zach Davis had ten at Sheehan, and Brandon Lighton had nine at Torrington. That's it. Like, I, there's a lot of other people who have had eight, and he's right there now. That's really cool. I forgot. I forgot to say our guest this week. <laughs> I no, yeah, forget. sorry, we dove right in. Dove right into it. Our guest this week. You know, speaking of uh, big conference games, which I love the conference game, man. I know we're, we're all about the alliance these days, but uh, um, you know, I think, uh, like I said, I've always said this: the alliance is good in, a, in small doses. We don't need eight weeks of it, but hmm. um, you know, two weeks might be even a little much. I like getting. You know, I like. I like to reconstitute ourselves into some actual. You know, this team plays that team and then the next and then everyone kind of plays around Robin. I love that idea because it's nothing like a little bit of regional rivalry in, in high school football. And our guest this week, we'll talk to a little bit about that in the NVL, the one that we everyone's always constantly, you know, complaining about the NVL. Oh, they don't join the alliance, this and everything. The NVL plays a little, just almost a, a strict league schedule and they have a big one coming up. They're going to play on Thursday they're play Holy Cross, which beat up on WCA in a other in another uh, matchup from this weekend. I, I was actually at that game to check out, see what the Crusaders are about. But on Thursday, short turnaround, especially for them playing on Saturday, they're going to come back Thursday and play an undefeated Naugatuck team, uh, which was pretty good. When we, speaking of other great games that happened, you know, Aunt Sonia, we'll talk about them in a little bit. Uh, they get a lot of trouble from Gilbert Northwestern. Um, I saw Windsor uh, hang on for dear life against Middletown, which was trying everything it could to come back in that game. And they won it on a uh, it was an accidental fake punt to put the game away. Uh, that was also on a Thursday night. So it was a great week, Pete. I thought it was really I thought it was really good. And, uh, you know, all hail league play all hail. Let's do, let's do that in some um, weeks. <laughs> right. But let's take a look at the top 10. Number one, just dropping now. Number one is Southington with six sixteen Now, first place votes. They bid up on Simsbury, 37 to nine. Uh, no letdown after knocking off Greenwich. They get East Hartford next. Number two is New Canaan. They lost the first place vote, but they beat up on Bridgeport Central. And it looks like Ty Groff is finally working his way back into into the uh, the lineup there. They're off actually now for another week until October 15th versus Norwalk. I guess we won't really, really see New Canaan until the second half of the year, Pete. They had a real easy, easy schedule to start. Yep. Number three is Maloney marching up after a 41 to 14 victory over Hall. They're four and They had a first place vote a couple weeks ago. Now all of a sudden it's gone. All our voters are voting again. I don't know what happened, but they are number three right now. And number four is Killingly. They have three first place votes. They can't get it higher than four. So someone's left them off that way down the list. <laughs> what are you laughing at? I, I, I'm reading Mike's. If you don't read our poll, read Mike's bottom lines. They're 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 very funny. Yeah. OK. <laughs> uh, Pete's just sitting here laughing. I'm like, what are you? <laughs> number five is Greenwich, which had no trouble with West Hill on Saturday. And then it gets a little interesting. Number six is St. Joseph, which did struggle a bit against Danbury, which was 3-0 for the first time. Glenn Morning was a quarterback back in 2003, and Rick Davis is head coach. Um, the, the Hogs didn't panic after the Hatters got within 10-7 with a little razzle-dazzle halfback option pass with, from by Aiden Montavo to Asher Jones to get within 10-7. Will Singwall goes right back to who else, Pete, but Clutch Hutch catches his TD pass in the back of the end zone. Hogs, still good, 4-0. They're at number six. I had them higher, but hey. Number seven is West Haven, which wiped out its old Thanksgiving rival Hill House. 
Uh, be sure to read Jeff Jacobs' story on Rich Boucher, their head coach is battling throat cancer again. We wish him the best. West Haven now looking really strong at, I think they might be even a little underrated here at number seven. Number eight is Ansonia, which surprise, surprise, got everything it can handle and then some by upstart newcomer Gilbert Northwestern Housatonic, which had the Chargers down early in the early in the fourth quarter on this crazy 94 yard touchdown pass from Nolan Reisdorf, junior quarterback hitting Fred Camp. Your guy, Pete, wide open on this catch. He was, he was wide, must have been a missed assignment or something. Wide open down the sidelines, zigzagging and finally collapsing into the end zone. Uh, that put Gilbert Northwestern, who is he up 20 to 14. But after that, it was all David Cassetti all the time. He is just awesome. Chargers escape 30 to 20. They're at number eight. Number nine is Shelton, which I, I dropped Shelton almost out of my top, uh, my top 15. But Shelton just couldn't score consistently or at all in the second half again which has turned out to be a fantastic north haven defense we haven't even talked about the night the newly christ nighthawks uh they only held Notre Dame to a couple tds and now shelton they shut out the gales in the second half and uh what happened to the greatest team shelton team in 20 years my goodness uh jeff caravas threw a td ran for another uh, that put the Nighthawks up for good. And, and Adam Pandolfi scored the insurance CD and was in on the final play. An amazing effort, Pete, by North Haven. And quickly, before we discuss that, number 10, Cheshire, kind of lying in the weeds there. I don't know if I see staples in there, though, Pete. Uh, I thought the uh, the records in pretty much, you know, beating Trumbull, holding them off, uh, I thought they might have deserved a little spot in there, huh? Yeah, I, I just get confused each week. So we see a game like this. Let's jump back to two weeks ago, right? Greenwich was number one. Southington, I think, was like six. Southington beats Greenwich. Southington flies up the board to number one. Greenwich drops from one to six, right? So you're penalizing Greenwich for losing to Southington, but also recognizing Southington's win and moving them up. This week, Trumbull loses to Staples. Trumbull is up to seven. Trumbull falls out of the poll. They're at number 11 now. Staples is 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I, I don't get it. I don't understand. If we're going to penalize Trumbull for losing that game, then we should reward the team that has a the same exact record and lost to a team that is number six in the poll. Yeah. And we're not going to give Staples any love. Look, that Staples-Trumbull game was great. I has, still have them. I have Staples and Trumbull both right on the fringe of my top ten. One of them might be in. I have Staples above tr Trumbull, but they're both three and one. Right? They both have good wins. They both have losses to good teams, and we're just getting rid of both. Of them. I, I'm just I feel bad for Staples because that's a huge win for them. That's a huge game for them. And if you look at the rest of their schedule, Danbury, Stanford, Norwalk, West Hill, you know, then Ridgefield and Greenwich to finish the season. So. We're going to start. The voters are going to start to reward Staples for wins over Danbury, Stanford, Norwalk, and West Hill, but we're not going to reward them for the win over Trumbull. It just it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, and I, I feel bad because I still think Trumbull is a top ten team, which means I obviously think that Staples is a top ten team. All right? It just I don't know. It just kind of I don't understand it. I feel I feel bad for the Wreckers because yeah. I think I think they should be in the top ten. I don't even think it should. I don't even think it should have been. An option like they should have been penciled in into the top 10 of everyone's ballot. I'm with you, Pete, to a certain extent. Um, in fact, Pete, let's get a second opinion as we uh, look at the day's top 10 coaches poll, which just dropped uh, as we were getting ready to do the uh, do the podcast. And here it is. The day's got number one, Southington, with five first place votes. Number two, New Canaan, with three first place votes. Number three, Maloney, with two first place votes. So far, so good. Now we start to diverge. Media's got Killingly with three first place votes at four. Coaches have got St. Joseph at number four with two first place votes. I kind of agree with that. I have St. Joseph at, at three on my ballot. Number five on the, in game time CT is Greenwich. Number five for the coaches is West Haven with one first place vote. I don't know about first place vote there, Pete, but West Haven at five, I'm all bored with that. In fact, I might have them at five or, at five or six. In my poll, Killingly is number six in the day's poll. 
Greenwich is down to seven. And then it gets crazy. Number eight, North Haven. Number nine, Shelton. And number 10, Hamden is their last team in here. And North Haven kind of gets in. No Aunt Sonia, uh, which is a little surprising. I don't know about North. I mean, listen, I thought North Haven had an amazing game the other night. Are they in the top 10, though? Remember, Notre Dame beat them. Notre Dame is the only team that Notre Dame lost to was West Haven. And West Haven beat them up. Notre Dame has done everything you could ask of them since that West Haven loss. Yeah, that's something that kind of confuses me as well. Because even if you look at ours, Notre Dame West Haven is in 19th. And North and Haven ours. is in 11, 12, thir- 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 13th. Like, Notre Dame lost to a team that people are voting in the top five. They got a first place vote. Like, how are we not voting Notre Dame higher as a collective? Like, it just doesn't make sense to me. Now, there could be people, voters, coaches, media members who look at West Haven, look at Hamden. They play in SEC tier two and they're not going to reward them again. The first Daniel hand team uh, when Phoenix Billings was a sophomore that won a state title. And I believe that was in 2017. That hand team, because we looked at it last year, was not ranked going into the state playoffs. Then they won Class L, and they jumped all the way up to two, I believe. And then they never left the top ten the rest of that, you know, kind of dynasty. Right. Okay? So, like, okay, so are people holding back West Haven on that? Well, probably not because they're in the top ten. So they're getting votes or getting high votes from somewhere. So I... I don't know. It's like a, what have you done for me lately? It feels like. I don't think enough people do their homework, Pete, personally. <laughs> I do remember in that 2017 season that everyone was given hand a lot of grief for being dropping into SEC tier two, which is, if you recall, SEC tier two is tier one is, you know, Notre Dame, Shelton uh, at the time in 2017, West Haven. Um, but uh, there's, I think and Xavier, uh, and uh, Fairfield Prep, right? Th- that crew. Um, and then tier two is Sheen, which is really the smallest school in the SEC. You have Hill House, which has traditionally been good, but not recently. Uh, Amity, one of the largest schools. I mean, it's a regional school, three towns. Three I went towns. there. <laughs> they're one of the largest schools in the in the state. I mean, they're in L. They're in tier, you know, granted, it's not a fo- it's not really a football town ish. They love their baseball and that, you know, other sport like track, certainly. But, uh, you know, they're in tier two. Um, I mean, Wilbur Cross, which has been a it's a big school, but has struggled in football and Hamden, which is, is the, the biggest by 100 kids. In the SEC, and they've struggled for a long time, even when Tommy took it over, we thought it was going to be an instant turnaround. Now, you know, I talked to a lot of the guys, Tom Unger, they, they tell me it's a lot different than it used to be where the city schools, especially the Hamdens and the West, especially the West Havens, where the kids, you know, we've written a huge story about this in the in game time CT this week. And Jeff Jacobs wrote a column. Um, we've even seen it elsewhere in other city schools and, and where some of them just they 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 have other issues they need to deal with. They have, don't have as nearly as much money as a lot of these suburban schools. They don't have the ability to go to camps. They don't have the ability sometimes to feed their kids. Uh, sufficiently, which is all these things are, are factors. And actually, it's coming out, Pete, um, this past week was the MIAA, the Massachusetts version of the CIAC. They are deciding that they're going to go to more of a power conference scheduling rather than strictly by size, which is what we've been doing here in Connecticut. The SEC certainly being the most progressive on that. They had Division One, Division Two. Now they went to this tier system, but it's all the same thing. It's smaller size and smaller power schools below and then the larger schools will go up top. They certainly have done it the last few years. So that has been going on. The NVL just did it power wise. The CCC just did it last year. The ECC's done it. The FCAC, not so much. They're staying with their, you know, two equal divisions. But then again, a lot of the FCAC teams are all double L's. Yeah. So it's a little, but, but that's they, well, the still- ECC. It's nice to see the SEC do it. The CCC coming on board, the NVL this year. The ECC. Killingly still in division three. Right. right. Well, they moved we're talking, down. We're talking about the best ECC team in the last 20 years. Right. Yeah. Some say. And they're playing division three in the SEC. Well, the ECC has been kind of a Frankenstein's mod. They can't figure out what they are. It's all depending on what coaches want. 
they've yeah. gone to power scheduling and they've then they've redone it. Then they've gone back and they've gone back and forth. They they haven't fully committed to it. Now they're everyone just here, needs to get on the same page. Right. Well, that's, here's my point. It. But the here's the point, problem. This is what I always kind of bug the SEC about is this is great. But. The state's not the following the state suit. doesn't do it and yeah. they base it all on class. So my bug about the whole thing is everybody's schedule is all over the place. The Hamden, their schedule, they have three tough games. If that right. Yeah. Shelton, meanwhile, <laughs> their entire schedule is a tough game. Like well, they gotta even, go through a ringer. But that's, you know, that's the same conference. If we look outside a conference, I just had a conversation with someone about this. You know, Xavier's one in three. Right. Xavier's one and three. They've played New Canaan, Fairfield Prep, lost both, beat Ludlow and lost to Notre Dame West. OK. Now, Darian, who's number two to start the year, they've played St. Joe's loss, Bridgeport Central win, Maloney loss, Fairfield Ward win. Well, you know, if Xavier played in the FCAC, they wouldn't be one and three. Right. They don't have Probably those not. games that they're they have to play everybody and cross over. So that's where it could, and the, both of them are fighting for a class L spot. And Xavier has to go through the ringer each and every week. And Darian doesn't some weeks, but they're playing for the same trophy. They're playing for the same spot. They're competing against each other while not even playing close to the same kind of schedule. Yeah. That makes no sense. We need to figure this out. I, I think that's what the Alliance guys all want to do is they want to make it scheduling by state, like the state why everyone gets under the, the alliance umbrella and then we figure it out. I hope that's what they want to do. Let's do it that way. And then I have no problems with it, but we need to match whatever we're doing here at the league level, which they leagues run these schedules. They need to start doing it at the state level. That needs to be connected. Those dots need to be connected because right now it's a mess. It's an utter mess. And they're using this, this back, 20 years ago, the playoff point system made sense when there were like 100 leagues or not 100, but like there are a lot more leagues there are now. Now there's only eight. I think there are at least 16 or something, maybe even more. But back then it made a lot more sense because those leagues were all small and they, you know, then you need to do your PowerPoint. But they need to figure it out like that's that's got to go. It's just got to go. And that's why I complain all the week with these schedules. Hamden and Fairfield Prep are playing for the same tri uh, state championship, yet their schedules are wildly different. Prep has got a much much harder schedule than Hamden. Do they deserve? I don't understand why. I don't know. Personally, I don't understand why there's this thing where if a team is bad, they have to play a bad schedule for a long time until they're good again. I mean, like, but, but yet they're still playing in, in a double L championship division. So you're like Crosby is a great, probably in the second division of the NVL, they're in double L and, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say they're going to win all their games, but you look at those games they got to play. You don't see like, you know, some of the heavyweights of the NVL in that list. Right. So they have a good, they have a much better shot than usual that then they have that to make the double L playoffs and crash that party. Yeah. And they're going to crash that party and they're going to leave someone, maybe Richfield who's sitting at two and two playing a pretty tough schedule in the FCAC. Not like a super tough schedule, but a tough enough schedule or a Fairfield prep who's sitting at one and three. I yeah. mean, it's not equal footing. Well, something clearly needs to be done there. And again, I, I don't want to be, you know. Banging. I'll be at this. Week. I don't want to. be. Yeah, I just don't want to be constantly, constantly harping on this. I mean, uh, it's the six division things. It's. That, that's a whole, you know, that between that and the schedules, you know, I, I start to sound like, you know, get off my lawn over here. You know, but, well, we uh, get know, to talk about well, we get to talk to Chris Anderson about it a little bit. So that's fun. Yeah, well, let's do that. And Pete, let's you know, it's a big game Thursday night. Be there. Be square. NVL game of the week. State, probably the state game of the week, because this is the week, Pete, where we're starting to finally get our buys. As you mentioned at the top, we got the FCAC, the SEC and the SWC all taking the, taking the week off. Deservedly so, but that leaves us with not a whole lot. We have ECC games, CCC games, NVL games, and they're playing on Thursday. I don't even know what I'm going to do on Friday, Pete. It's kind of a light schedule, huh? Yeah, I, I have no idea what's going to happen. I know where I'll be Thursday, and that's good enough for me on Monday. So let's bring on our buddy Chris Anderson. <laughs> Joining us on the show is, of course, the second-year head football coach of Nagaduck, Nagi High School up in uh, up in the Valley. 
two-time state champ over at Woodland. He's a, he's a legend around these parts. Chris Anderson, how you doing, Coach? What's happening? Thanks for joining us a little bit on this uh, Monday morning. I'm doing well, Sean and Pete. Thanks for having me today. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us. This is this was exciting. Sean Sean texted me yesterday, and he's like, "We're having Chris Anderson on, so like get ready." So I'm ready. I'm excited. There's a lot here. I'm pumped. But right off the bat, I mean, you guys are four and zero. You guys got Holy Cross on Thursday. Short week, like Sean said. I mean, what are you doing hanging out with us? Then shouldn't you be getting prepared for for Legi? Well, I figured rather than staring at film all day long, I've been doing it since uh, we got done on the game on Friday. So it's been a pretty busy weekend for me. I'm happy to be able to talk to somebody else and relax a little bit. <laughs> Was uh, uh, I saw you guys over at the over at Municipal, you know, very serious up there. Um, who, who, uh, who's uh, who's your assistant again? Jeez, uh, I can't remember. Also, draw a blank. Chris Maffo. Oh, Maffo. Jeez, yeah, Maffo. Maffo, you know, Maffo's on this show. Was he? We did do yeah. Maff, didn't we? We did Maffo a couple of years ago. I, I feel I feel bad. I for also I this time of the morning I was I was losing my train of thought. But you and Maff sitting up there, we were we were watching. I'm like, what do you, what do you think they're noticing here? What do you think they're they're checking out? What's he saying to Maff? What's he saying over there? Uh, what did you think of Holy Cross? I mean, what did you think of him? They they pretty much put a. a uh, they did what they needed to do. They, they they were pretty tough against the WCA, which was a pretty big team too. And they're, they look pretty good at the WCA, but the kind of wheels just kind of fell off there. They look really strong this year. Uh, HC, what, what do you expect out of them on Thursday? Well, for starters, you know, when they play at home, they play with a lot of confidence for sure. And they're really big and strong and physical. You know, they, this year they're running the ball extremely well with Legi. Um, they have an, an excellent speedster, number one. I can't think of his name right now. But uh, the quarterback play is, you know, the Coet kid. He's really coming on. He's only a sophomore. But they're really starting to open up and getting more balance into their offense. And they're well coached. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always talk about Coet, you know, his old man. <laughs> he's screaming at the sidelines. Um, but uh, I didn't know he was just a sophomore. I completely that. I mean, he looked pretty good on, uh, on Saturday. It looks like they're going to add a little bit of throwing a little bit more this year, you know, kind of keep teams off balance with Levy, huh? Oh, certainly. You know, in the beginning of the year, I think they were really getting their philosophy in place of running the ball. But now over the last couple of weeks, they've really started opening things up. And, you know, Coet has great pedigree. You know, like you said, his, his uh, dad, Jimmy, defensive coordinator there, and he was on our staff at Woodland one year. A very knowledgeable guy, very fiery guy. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, they'll be ready to play for sure. Um, so tell me about your guys. Uh, you listen, you're off to a really great start. A little bit of a scare there from the uh, beginning of the season with uh, with Gilbert, but, you know, it looks like they've proven themselves already in this league, huh? Sure. You know, week one is always tough because you don't really have any information on the team. You don't know what they're going to be doing. Um, and they're really skilled, number one, and Gilbert's well coached. And, you know, it certainly didn't help any when the first play of the game when we lost Jet Hall on a 54-yard run. You know, you don't, it's hard to plan for those things. And, you know, we had to improvise and some of our playbook was cut out, you know, early in the game. And, uh, you know, we've evolved since certainly, but uh, Gilbert is a good team. Well, what, what's been doing? I mean, obviously jet, you haven't had him. So I mean, I don't think you're going to have him for this week. I think uh, a lot of everyone knows that, but uh, you know, what have you, how have you guys been able to adjust? I mean, you, you got another kid there who's, who's just as good as running the rock. Sure. Well, I mean, Caden Martin is a fantastic, he's an all-state football player, in my opinion, as is uh, Michael Dietelbaum. So we still have two pretty good running backs. And when Jet went down, we inserted Jalen Martinez. Now he was scheduled to be in the mix a little bit offensively, but in the preseason, we lost our starting free safety, Ryan Dietelbaum, Michael's younger, younger brother. So we had to move Jalen, who was a starting corner, to safety. And to learn that position, we took him off of the offensive plate. And then, of course, you know, he has to go into the game in week one. because right back in. <laughs> well, you know, the, life spoke, of, uh, the life of the depth chart. Yeah. Well, we spoke at St. Joe's this summer uh, at a scrimmage, and you were raving about Dietelbaum, Martin, and obviously Jet Hall and just how – 
great of a you know three headed attack this would be. You know, obviously Dito Bomb was a stud last year. I had one NVL coach tell me like, if it wasn't a senior award for the NVL, if it was an MVP, he was voting for Dito Bomb last year. I mean, obviously he's a player, um, but you know how have him and Martin? You know, okay, Jet Hall's not in the lineup now. How have they taken on you know the other responsibilities and kind of led? You know, kind of not next man up because they were up, but, you know, one less man down or something like that. Put that sure. on a shirt. Well, they had to carry more load, you know, carry the ball more. And I'm sure they're happy with that. But uh, that being said, all along, you know, there's no ego. You know, those guys understand our offense. And one of the nice things about the wing T is you're able to give the ball to several different players mm -hmm. and not really be a one trick pony and use misdirection. And, you know, we, tr we try to share the wealth as well, because we want to make it fun for the kids. Um, so we try to get them 10 plus carries each throughout the course of the game. But you're allowed to have fun in high school football. Imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you know, I mean, this is, you know, and I'm not, I don't want to disregard, uh, Martin for a second. I don't want to disregard him, but you know, Dito Bomb and Legi were studs as juniors in this league coming off a of missed year. And here they are Thursday night. I mean, this is Thursday night football, right? You know, let's get yeah. caught here. We got two of the best running backs in the NVL here going at it head to head. This game's going to be like an hour and 15 minutes. We're going to be in and out, in and out, running, running the clock. It's just going to be first downs and stuff. But, you know, how do you prepare for a guy like to uh, play defense against a guy like Tom Legey? And then how do you prepare offensively with guys like Dietlbaum and Martin to say, well, we're just going to take it right to him? Well, to, to answer that question, you know, I try not to make the game too difficult. You know, when you got players like Dietlbaum and Martin, you just give them the ball and watch them play, you know, for one. <laughs> Um, to stop Legi is a tall order, but I'll say that uh, Chris Maffo is our defensive coordinator and himself and our staff have, have worked really hard and put together a good plan, as they always do. Um, if Chris Maffo isn't the assistant coach of the year, I don't know who is. Um, so, But we're going to have our hands full. Legi is a strong kid, and with their balance, you just can't focus on him. His assistant coach of the year, uh, you know, I think the vote rides on – did he prepare you for this interview? Did he tell you what we were going to bring yeah. to the table? Because if he didn't, if he let you high and dry, I mean, he's a veteran of this show. Well, I tell you, I got caught off guard. I got the text message from Sean. What yesterday? Hey, yeah. can you do this tomorrow morning? And, uh, yeah. Lucky I could fit you in the schedule. No, yeah. I was at Lyman. I was at Lyman Orchard. I'm picking apples, uh, coach. You know, I'm like, oh my god, I got to get somebody on from the podcast. Pete's going to kill me if I don't do it. Um, but uh, I figured you were like, you know either taking a break and watching an NFL game or in the cave already just rewinding film back and forth. Probably that's what I kind of like. I envisioned it. I don't know. Was that the case? Where were you? What were you doing? A lot of film this weekend for sure. You know, we brought the, uh, the staff in seven o'clock Saturday morning. We had a four and a half hour meeting. We were done at 1130. I grabbed some lunch. I came back in the office, grinded for a few hours. Then we went over to the stadium and watched Holy Cross. Yeah. And then we brought our team in uh, Sunday morning yesterday, seven o'clock and, we practice for three hours and, um, you know, we understand the implications of this game. It's a big game and we want to make sure that we have all of our T's crossed and I's dotted. That's a tough thing. That's a quick turn. I mean, people talk about the quick turnarounds in the NFL going up on Thursday night. NBL has been doing Thursday night games for a long time now. And you know, what, how do you, you know, how do you adjust the schedule? How do you get kids prepared for that? Well, normally after a Friday night game, we bring the kids in, um, in the morning on Saturday, we just do film session from the game. We lift them, we run, and then we, we cut them loose until Monday. And then our staff meets on Sunday, but when you play on Thursday, we give them off on Saturday and then we bring them in on Sunday to get that extra day of practice. So that I come in on Sunday. Well, I mean, this is why you do this and when, when you're playing an undefeated team and you know, this is where it gets fun. Yeah. You know, so I, I jumped out of bed excited, as did our whole staff. I was really, really proud of our staff and our players for getting out of bed and being here on time and just having smiles on their face and running around the field. You know, that, that you know your culture is starting to become really positive when you see that on a Sunday morning. Well, tell me a little bit about that. I mean, you come in off a of pandemic year. I mean, Nogadoc had been making strides. They've been actually doing a lot better uh, under the previous coach. He had the pandemic year you know, lots of chaos. 
you know, how realistic did you think, a turn, you know, getting the team back up, playing at a high level is going to be? You did it pretty quick. You beat Ansonia year one, which is everybody's goal. And Nog's like, that's like step thing. Can you beat Ansonia? And then, you know, can you go on and win in the playoffs? You know, how, how did long did you expect it? Did you even surprise yourself by how quickly it took? Well, it certainly was an evolution. You know, when we started last year, I think we had 60 players come out for the team in August. And, you know, by week three, we were down to like 30, you know, once they realized what football really is. And, you know, we started off in a spread offense last year. And then we realized, hey, you know, we're not having success throwing and catching on air. And we got these running backs. So right in the preseason, when we were rolling into scrimmages, we completely threw the playbook in the garbage and we went to the wing tee from day one and we struggled a little bit early last season as we lost in week two to Torrington. You know, we just weren't quite ready yet, but uh, the bye weeks were early for us last year. And that was, we were able to get back to basic and use it like a camp. So um, we started getting better and better each week. And, you know, the ball kind of bounced our way towards the end of the season, especially against the Ansonia. And to get that win certainly helps you roll into the off season with, you know, the belief system and buying in in the program. We had a great off season in the weight room. And uh, now, you know, the kids understand, they believe in what we're doing, hopefully. You're, uh, I mean, you're, you started the program at Woodland. Uh, you know, and we all talked about last year, how kind of, you know, tough that was to Jade, but you were looking for something, you know, different and Noggy is right there. I mean, uh, you know, how was that transition coming in and, and uh, you know, taking over a, a, a rival program, you and Moff? Um, I mean, again, last year, that game against Woodland last year was, you know, just emotionally great. It was just really fun to watch. And then what you said to the kids after the game and telling everybody that you love each side. And I thought it was really wonderful. But, you know, what, how, was, how tough was it, uh, you know, making that move? And, you know, and how do you feel now? You feel like you're a part of the Noggy family now, I, I'm sure. Well, you know, my son went to Woodland and, you know, we lived in Beacon Falls and he had just graduated last year. And I wasn't sure if I was going to get back into the high school game again. Um, but there are certain jobs that you have to at least take a look at. And Naugatuck has always been that one for me growing up in the Valley. And when it opened, you know, I, to be honest, I waited until the last day, the closing day, and I hit send. And I said, you know what, I've always thought about this. So let me at least apply. And then when I went to the interview process, I felt really good. Naugatuck seems like, and in, in it, it has come through that they really want to um, be committed to winning here. And, you know, for me, that's certainly important the way we work. We always want to have a chance, you know, at the end of the season to, to raise a trophy or to have a good team. And uh, it felt great, the process. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to get the job. And then I was able to bring on Chris Maffo. We have a history of, you know, I was his assistant when he was a head coach. He was my assistant the first time around at Woodland. Um, was able to bring in some guys like Cody Kingsley, who played quarterback for me, you know, at Woodland. Uh, Sean McGowan is on our staff. He was a great running back for yep. us in 2015. Um, and then you tie in some of the, the noggy guys like Ryan Greasenhauer and uh, Mark Swanson and uh, Matt Burke, who all play for Nuggetuck. So they have that pride and their teachers in the building and everything just seemed to come together. The support is great. We have a lot of people working in the building, as I said, which certainly helps. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was hard in the beginning, but I think you have to love challenges if you're in this game for sure. And, uh, you know, my time at Woodland was unbelievable. You know, I spent 20 years there as a teacher and I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to come over as a teacher because there wasn't, a job in the building at the time. And then after I accepted the job, they came back and had a teaching position. So I moved over, um, gave up all my sick days to come over here, <laughs> like a hundred <laughs> sick days they accumulated. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it certainly has been challenging. Uh, it's been fun. Um, and here we are going into a huge football game. That's, you know, it's crazy is when I first started, I'm pretty confident I covered you coaching Woodland with Sean at running back. I just remember that. I don't know why this was like right at the beginning of my career. I remember they're like, yeah, why don't you go to Woodland? They're playing whatever game. And I was like, I've never been here before because I've never been this deep into the Valley in Connecticut. It was wild experience. Now I've been to Beacon Falls more times than uh, most people in the state can say. (laughs) 
Well, you know, having Sean, certainly, what a great player he was for us yeah. in 2015. And then he went on to WPI and had a great football career there. He was captain. I think he's the all-time league rusher there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we have a great rapport. That's the one thing I love about, you know, the, the high school football game. The sports in general is, you know, when you, you teach the kids a certain way and then they want to come back and give back. And, you know, for Sean to take off his woodland cap and now wear the Naugatuck cap, as we have done as well, um, shows a loyalty, you know, to the people that have helped you to become what you are. And, you know, that's what we try to build in our program. Uh, uh, any program that we're in coach I can't believe it it's been 20 years <laughs> so maybe even more when you started Woodland you know and you and you just mentioned it but you look at it back now you look at all what all your former players are doing it, it is amazing how impactful you know Woodland's players have been over the years I mean you know you go from Tanner Kingsley you go from you know all the just so many guys Shane and and so many guys kind of spreading out and kind of like spreading the gospel as it were, what they learned from maybe you and what they learned from each other and all the coaches they had there, you and Mop and, you know, even Tim and all the guys, you know, you know, just looking back on it now, can you, what do you think? I'm really proud of the fact that guys like Timmy Shea has gone on to be a playoff coach at Plainville and um, Tim Phipps is over at Hopkins and they won the championship last year yeah. and Adam, Adam Schultz, we had at Woodland. He, I brought him on when I was at the University of New Haven, and now he is um, the head coach at Post University in Waterbury. And Shane Kingsley's head basketball coach at Ansonia, and uh, you know the list goes on and on. And that's again one of the things. Winning certainly is nice, and that's what we want to do. We aspire to win, but we also aspire to win the game of life. You know, we we want people in our program to move forward and not be stagnant, and you know, learn the things that. Or, or execute the things in life that they learn through football, hard work and being loyal and setting high goals for yourself. And we're really proud. I'm really proud of all of our, you know, uh, Woodland alums who have gone on and soon to be Naugatuck alums to go on. Um, it, it, yeah. yeah. Would, could we just quickly talk about the fact that you were at UNH uh, when the program came back and I, I'm a Southern alum. And I was at Southern when UNH came back and then you came in and you just like ruined all of our dreams every year. <laughs> so like, well, you know, what's yeah, the deal with that coach? You know? I did five years at the university of New Haven. Um, when they brought the program back in 2008, I was basically harassing coach Pete Rosamondo, <laughs> um, head coach there to come on as an assistant. I, I felt like my time at Woodland the first time around was you know, coming to an end and I was ready for the new challenge. And I always wanted to coach in college. And, you know, Pete, after a couple of months, took me on and I worked my way up there on staff. Um, and we had three um, conference championships. We went to the national playoffs twice. We had great players for sure. We were able to redshirt the first class. So we really had a bunch of those players for five years. And uh, we had great talent and New Haven, they, they committed to excellence with, you know, uh, scholarship money. And we were able to get some kids out of Florida. And um, we, we had a family atmosphere there with the staff and, you know, uh, it was a lot of fun, great experience. Yeah. I was there at the game first game in 09 at Southern. And I think you guys hung like 56 on. <laughs> Southern. They, they actually beat us the first year when our kids were freshmen and then we had squeaked out a, a win the second year. Um, it was in new Haven, but then yeah, years three and four, oh, we, that's right. we were pretty good yeah. those years. You're not to yes. with us. Yeah. This, that blue turf, man. That blue turf. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a swimming pool. Yeah. Uh, coach, was there a sense that you made, I mean, there was, I remember back then, you know, it was like, that's the natural progression. Coach Anderson, you know, he's young. He's going to go maybe coaching college. There was a moment there, right? You were thought you might be, you know, working your way to become a, a college coach, a big time college coach. Well, my whole life, since I was little, the only thing I ever wanted to do was coach in college or I had these big dreams of going to the NFL. But, uh, you know, life throws you curveballs, you know, and at the time where I had a chance to move full time, you know, my son was coming up and I know the commitment level and possibly moving around. And I wanted to, I actually got out of coaching high school and college so that I could coach youth sports and be a part of my son's upbringing there. And I coached little league. I coached travel basketball. I started a flag football program and I loved those times just as much as I loved, you know, 
beating Southern or, you know, going up against Naugatuck and now going up against Woodlands. So uh, that was a great time in my life too, coaching my son and all those teams. Well, quick before we go, we're running out of time here, but quick before you go, um, your all-time most memorable football game coach, which is it that you coached in? Wow, that's a tough one, Sean. Um, <laughs> can I name a couple? You can name yeah. a couple. All right, so I think may, maybe when I was a player in high school at Derby, we beat Ansonia 10-7. to um, That right. was a great special moment. Um, you know, anytime you beat Ansonia, that's a special moment because let's face it, <laughs> how many teams beat them? Like, not many. <laughs> You know, and I've been very fortunate and lucky that I've been able to come out on top with, you know, as a player and then at Woodlands and then at Naugatuck. And I'm sure if they're watching this, they're putting it up on the bulletin board. But, uh, you know, anytime you beat those Valley teams, because it means so much in the Valley football. So, you know, you beat Seymour along the way, you beat a Naugatuck. Um, to beat Woodland last year was certainly special. You know, I remember with coaching Dan Arlowski at Shelton, we beat Greenwich for the double L championship in the year right. 2000. That was a special moment. I enjoy them all because any win you get is so hard because it's hard to beat anybody. You know, everybody is practices and anything can happen in any game. The games are so short and if you're not holding on to the ball, yada, yada. But, you know, I, I, I truly enjoy all the wins. Two Did favorite you? for me. Two favorite. Hold on. Two favorite for me. Yeah. Uh, your championship victory over Brookfield was ridiculous. Like and th them marching down the field. They're not much of a passing team. Them marching down the field and you guys stopping them at the end. Bedlam at Trumbull. I'm wearing like slippers because I was, I was wanting to be comfortable and Joe Palladino going, what the hell is this? I'm wearing slippers. But I just remember Doris going nuts, the whole team going nuts. That was an awesome game. Uh, I think it was like 18 to 15 or 18, 13 or something crazy 19, like that. 13. 19, 19, 13. 19, 13. Pretty, yeah, right off the top of my head. Not bad. And then the other one was a loss when you guys lost to Ansonia, uh, Alex Thomas's record-breaking night. That was like the day of Bill Ganillo, the former newscaster, Bill Ganillo's funeral came down from Holy Cross. It was a Thursday night game at their place. And you guys, as awesome as Alex Thomas was, you guys were right there, right yeah. there. And back and forth. That was 62 to 35, and it was 35 real points. I mean, how, if you would think you're going to score 35 points at Ansonia, who was the number one team in the state, you're going to feel pretty good about it. And then you're <laughs> yeah. by 30. Yeah. <laughs> who, who, oh, man, who was great for you that night? Was it Will, Will Volage? Volage. Oh. He, he returned two kickoffs for touchdowns, a third for 80 yards. He threw a touchdown pass and caught a touchdown pass in one game. Those are the two, my two favorite all time Chris Anderson games. I, those are the ones I've been to. I mean, I think a third one would be the one you know you played with last year. But uh, I remember you vividly after that game, just so emotional. You were, and I, you were like tears are streaming down your face, and I just remember saying to you, Coach, what's wrong? You, I'm just so proud of my kids, and I'm just like, well, there he is, right there. Just an amazing response, and uh, you know, I that stuck with me. I don't know why, but uh, you know, it's just one of those things. That's why I love covering this stuff. And just memories like that, and watching you guys go through this, it's it's a lot of fun from this angle. I'll tell you that, but. Hey, you got anything else for coach or what? Yeah, I got coach. You know, you're you're a Valley guy through and through, and the NVL is is kind of at a a crossroads. I would maybe say, um, obviously, the alliance is looming. Um, you know, the NVL and the Pequot are not involved in it. And then on the flip side, you look the last couple of years, the success in the postseason for the NVL is not what it has been. You know, what does the NVL have to do as a whole to? you know, maybe get back to winning state titles? Um, is it joining the Alliance? Is it playing out of, con you know, not maybe not joining the Alliance, but maybe playing one or two out of conference games, or is it just stay the path and, you know, great teams will win? Well, it's, I think that's kind of a loaded question and a lot of different things come into play, but for sure, you know, I, I voted for the Alliance, you know, anytime you can play a team of your caliber from outside, you know, it's going to raise the bar up for sure, coaching wise, playing wise. Um, and then I just think, you know, within in your league of each program individually getting better, you know, doing offseason programs and evolving and, you know, things of that nature. If, if you do those two things, I think that you'll start to see more success in the postseason. Do you like the setup, the new setup, the D1, D2? 
Um, I do. I, you know, there's, there's always pros and cons, but uh, you know, we're, to be honest with you, we, whatever my schedule says, that's what we're going to play. And I don't really buy too much into it. I don't comment on anything. Here's the schedule. Let's deal with it one week at a time and let's get after it, see where the, the chips fall at the end of the season. Fair enough, coach. Well, you got a big one. This is a, obviously a huge one for you this week. And uh, I'm sure the kids are fired up to play. You know, I think you're going to get a lot of people out at that game to see what you guys are about and what Holy Cross is all about. We, especially, uh, we, we thank you so much for joining us here. Give us a little time. I know you're really busy. So go get them, coach. And, uh, you know, we'll see you on Thursday. Thanks. Thank coach. you guys so much for having me. Take care. Appreciate all right. Be good. So, Pete, that was Chris Anderson. I uh, didn't want to quite answer your question there at the end. Uh, doesn't want to get into scheduling. Uh, he's not like us. He doesn't want to get into scheduling snafus. But where were you put in front of me? That's well played. I, I had I, to ask him, though. I mean, I had to ask. He's a really well-respected coach in the state in the NVL. Here's a guy who went and played as a coach at the collegiate level. And uh, I wanted his opinion. On I thought, I thought, hey, we got him. I'm going to ask him. I think it would be good for Naugatuck. I don't think we really got with that. I mean, you mentioned it. They haven't won a state playoff game in years. They go. They've been, you know, next to Ansonia, probably one of the most consistent teams recently to get into the state playoffs. And every single time. And last year, they were pretty close. They played they played pretty tough. But, uh, you know, but they didn't, you know, they didn't make it out. And they had they've had top seeds. And, you know, so. Uh, I would think it would probably benefit. I think that's probably why he did it. I mean, you asked him that, but I, you know, I think it's probably why he did it. It would benefit Naugatuck to play, you know, an L school. Like, or like, like it did Newtown when Newtown went into the Alliance. I think, I think it would benefit them though. I did come up with an idea mm. after, uh, after uh, the scores from this past week and, you know, all the other things that have been going on, but the Gilbert Northwestern who's a tonic and Sonia score kind of raised my eyebrow a little bit. Maybe the NVL and the Pequot kind of get their feet a little wet. Maybe they do like their own, like one week. We have a little bit of a crossover. Mm. I think that could be fun. I think that could be a nice little wet the feet kind of wade their way into this, you know, uh, non-conference schedule. Uh, because I mean, here's Gilbert coming over from the Pequot and looking really good in their first four games. I mean, this is a good Gilbert team, like they got the pieces. Freddie Camp is a really good player. You know, Scott Scott does such a great job with that program. It's one of the first teams I ever covered when I started here, uh, started in Connecticut. I think that could be fun. Get a little crossover between the Pequot and the NVL, kind of let them test out the waters. I mean, they're the piece to this, and we've said this numerous times because of the size. You, <clears throat> you keep touching yeah, your mic. Mike, I stop touching my mic. Um, you know, I we keep talking about the NVL and the Pequot being the missing piece because of the smaller schools. And there's a lot of S and M schools in there where maybe they play one game against each other, feel it out, see if they like it, yeah. you know, and then going forward maybe. Because that Gilbert, uh, Gilbert showed me a lot just coming into the NVL. Look, you know, you're never going to find a bigger Pequot fan than myself right here. I love the Pequot, Pete. I, uh, I went to see Cromwell Portland play its first big test. I guess North Brantford team trying to get back after losing to Valley Regional, you know, and I wanted to get a look at Tommy Hansen, who we wrote a story about, their, their sophomore running back, North Brantford. And unfortunately, Tommy Hansen was out uh, after just the, his first carry of the game. It looks like he might have got dinged up. They rightly so took him out after giving him a little, little checkup. You know, no need to go crazy on that. Uh, but you know what? Given that, you know, Jack Meehan, Played great for North Brantford. He returned a kickoff back for a touchdown, and he scored a late TD. It was 27-14. Maybe it's a different game there with Tommy Hansen, but I do like the Pequot a lot. I mean, obviously, there's other other teams. Uncas is really good this year. You have SMSA. You have uh, Granby Canton coming back. Um, Capital Prep is joining. He, they're in the caucus. They're, they've joined. They're you know, boosting the profile of the league. The funny thing about the Pequot is, since we've gone to the six divisions, all their most of their schools are in double S. And all the NVL schools, and most of them are in are just an S. This is one of those things where, like, those two S and double S are so similar. Uh, it just that's it drives me nuts. I'd like to see those teams play. I wouldn't mind it being like there on one side, and you win the NVL, and then you win the Pequot, and then the winners would go for play for the state championship. I, that I would like something like that. <laughs> um, you know, maybe have some league cooperation instead of a uh, you know going by class. I think that like, would be cool like too. the Bulls. Like yeah, like do it like, you know, the SEC tier one will play an S the winner of the FCAC tier one champion or the winner of the SEC tier one 
or CCC tier one champion. Maybe they reorganize into three yeah, tiers. Well, it took, it took, the FCAC, took the FCAC 70 years to fix the hockey schedule. Yeah. So <laughs> if we're still doing this when the FCAC finally changes, I'll be I'll be surprised. But I would think that's a good idea. Maybe you every league offers they have three. You have three tiers and you the winner of those tiers get matched up with the winners of the other tiers based on record. And then that's your state. I mean, champion. So you got FCAC SCC. Yeah. SWC CCC CCC is really big. Well, no, I'm not necessarily need to. I mean, you could do S FCAC SCC SWC, maybe, nah. but maybe you have a, or maybe you bring Newtown in over to an SEC tier or whatever. I don't know. I mean, there's a way and to you got to bring Southington Windsor Maloney in. Cause yeah, CCC. you have a tier instead of it by like, we do district model by size. You do it by a power conference. You have the SEC version. And they can the we FCAC call it the power version. conference? Maybe Newtown is part of the SEC, uh, the FCAC one. And then the winner, like there'll be like a sectional. The winners of those two leagues will play each other. And then the the winner goes to the state championship against the, the CCC and the, you know, ECC or whatever, the two CCC. I ones. mean, you could really split it up. Just get rid of the conferences and just do yeah. the programs. Right. So that Southern <laughs> and, District model. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, then Southern Kid and Xavier are kind of in the same one. So it doesn't have a CCC, SCC kind of split like Xavier being in Middletown would play in that with Windsor and Maloney yeah. and, and Middletown. And then, you know, Fairfield Prep might, you know, there's. We could do we could do, you know, maybe we should do a whole show, plan it out, write it out, do it on a whiteboard. I'm all, I'm all in on. It. I think we should do that beginning and uh, beginning next year after we get the state cha- championships and the all state teams done. Let's you and I sit down, maybe bring Forno in and bring some of our guys in. I think that'd be fascinating. But uh, Pete, we're going to have to wrap this up real quick. But uh, what do we got on the picks podcast? Who, who are we picking this week? It was a wild week. You know, what are the games to look out for, for the picks podcast Not... coming up on Thursday? So the games this week. The FCX on by the who's on the by the FCX on the by the SEC. Most of the SEC is on a by most of the SWC is on a by. Um, so this week on the picks, we got our 10 games. we got Connard at Simsbury. We got Bullard Havens at ATI. Naugatuck at Holy Cross the game. We talked about this is a good one in the Pequot Cromwell Portland versus Granby Canton. Uh, Sheehan versus Hill House. Wilton. Going up to Tallinn to play the Eagles. Stonington at Rocky Hill. Crosby, 3-1 at Waterbury Career Academy, 3-1. Avon, 2-2, two two, going to Falcon Field to play my boys from Platt. And uh, Manchester at Middletown. So a lot of uh, make-or-break games, a lot of teams with similar records. Winners obviously go to 3-2, and two, which is at the midway mark, which is important. And the losers go into 2-3, and three, which might be too big of a hole to dig themselves out of. All right, so an eventful Pickham's podcast. I thought I had that thing. I thought I had it all locked up there this week with the, my, my Northwest United pick over Cheney Tech. But, uh, but no, no, I had to go and pick Xavier or Notre Dame, and Notre Dame gave me the business there. So we'll talk about that. We'll have a little fun on the Pickham's podcast coming up on Thursday. But uh, for now, this has been the Meat Grinder. Uh, Pete, any final words? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. We go into week five. Oh, my goodness. We're almost at midseason. Week five. It's October. The chill's in the air. I can't wait. It's going to get even better than this. I guarantee it. So, for Pete Paguaga, this is Sean Patrick Bowley. This has been the Meat Grinder on Game Time CT. Love you all.